Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Cross and Crown Channel is about presenting powerful proof for the Christian faith. If you want to support Mike as he makes videos and writes books, just go to Mike's Patreon page at patreon.com backslash mrob and kick in a buck or so. If you join us over there, that would be awesome. Supporting this work will help bring countless people to Christ. If you like this video, there's a donation button on our main YouTube page. Thanks for hanging out. Now, the New Testament we know is the Word of God because of the possible the contrary. I'm not going to break that argument down for you tonight. Also, because of the tremendous amount of proof in the Messianic prophecies that came true in the life of Christ, and also because Jesus said so, and that's most importantly. But there's also a lot of information about Jesus that a lot of skeptics and critics don't know about, or at least they dismiss or don't talk about, as well as many Christians. Josephus might be the most famous passage that talks about Jesus, and I'll read it right now. It was probably penned about 93 AD by a Jewish historian named Josephus. He also uh, fought with the Romans, and so he had Roman citizenship, and he was a Pharisee, a former Pharisee. He said this, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such as people accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had him condemned to be crucified, those who in the first place had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared to them, restored to life, for the prophets of God prophesied these and countless other marvelous things about him, and the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. So that's the writings of Josephus. It almost sounds like a New Testament writing in some ways, but it's not. It's by a Jewish guy who was a Pharisee who was just trying to report the facts. What's interesting is are some skeptics that say, well, some of this may not be real. Maybe it's been uh, added, certain information added to that passage, the original passage. And I'm thinking that as I study it, it seems to be on the whole all authentic. And I'll tell you why. One reason is, and notice it says, Josephus says this, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man. That is not the terminology that Christians used in the first century or in the second century. Christians did not use that term for Jesus, a wise man. But Josephus uses it to talk about Elisha and other people in his works. So it's a Josephus type of phrase, not a Christian type of phrase. He also called Christians a tribe. And that's not what the Christians used to describe themselves. They would say there's actually many tribes that would become Christians. But Josephus used a term to describe all Christians as tribe. That's also a very uh, Josephus type of word. So it seems to uh, say that this was actually penned by Josephus, a first century Jewish guy, a former Pharisee, who then sided with the Romans later, and then he wrote these histories. He wrote histories and talked about John the Baptist. He also talked about Jesus, his brother James. But this passage is the most famous passage. So we see some things that are not typical Christians being put into this passage. So it seems to be on the whole because it was also uh, written in many different languages around the Roman Empire with the same words. And so it says this also about Jesus that is not a really a Christian way of speaking. It said that those who had loved him did not give up on him, but they actually did. If you recall, all the Gospels talk about when Jesus died, the disciples ran and hid, right? So they did give up on him. They would never say something like this. So the Christians could not have put that in there. This seems to be part of how Josephus would communicate it. And so it talks about Christ's death and his resurrection by a first century Roman historian. That's powerful. That's amazing. And of course, when they say, well, there's nothing outside the New Testament, we don't need anything outside the New Testament to begin with because the New Testament is the word of God and it's infallible and it's perfect and it has all that messianic prophecy as proof. Also, remember, the New Testament is made up of 27 different books. So it's not a circular argument because there's 27 different books, not just one book. The Bible is not just one book. It's 66 books. So that's a fallacious argument. If they try to say, well, that's circular, just using the New Testament. No, there's different books within the New Testament written by different authors at different times in different parts of the world. 
So that's the main thing to understand, that the Bible is the word of God, and the contrary is not even possible. Now, another guy named Tacitus, he lived around 55 AD to about 120. He wrote this. He said, um, there was a report that Nero fastened the guilt on the, and on the tortured class of Christians hated for their abominations, called Christians, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. So notice that Tacitus mentions Christians, he mentions Christ, he mentions that he was executed under Pontius Pilate. That's powerful. That's not in the New Testament. This is extra biblical material. We don't need this extra biblical material. And anytime we look at extra biblical material, we have to use tools of analysis and examination. And when we do that, we're employing, and I won't get into this argument too much right now, but we utilize these things that are called universal immutables. These things that never change when we're looking at things, when we're examining things, when we're using our analytical skills. We have to use these universal immutables and only God who has universal reach and power and who is immutable can account for these things. So even studying these things, even researching these things, even bringing forth an examination requires God to exist. Hello, Lance. So good to have you. Hello, Samuel. Good to have you. Shalom to you, uh, you man of God. So good to see you. God bless you. So uh, Pliny, about 115, 120 AD said the Christians were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light and they sang uh, verses of a hymn to Christ as a God. So here's a pagan understanding that Christians early, early on sang songs to Jesus as God. So it wasn't Jesus being God. His deity was not made up in the third or fourth century. You know, uh, this was already all known by even pagan historians saying this are the Christians. And this guy did this around 120 AD. Justin Martyr around 150, 160 AD. He was a guy who lived in Samaria. What's interesting about Justin, he was a great apologist, one of the first great apologists. An apologist is one who brings forth the defense of the faith. He, he proves Christianity's true. And if I'm talking a little bit fast tonight, that's because I just got through with my workout. And so my juices are up, if you will, my adrenaline's up. So I'll try to slow down a little bit. But Justin Martyr was a very unique guy. He was a pagan philosopher in Samaria. If you know the geography, Samaria is pretty close to Galilee and almost, you know, not quite as close, obviously, to Judea. And so this guy was living in that area and he got saved. So he's a pagan philosopher, Justin Martyr, and he gets saved. And one day he decides to go down and investigate where Jesus lived. And he records as he went down there, he bumped into a farmer on the way to Jesus's old house. And he talked to the farmer about Jesus. And the farmer said, well, see this wooden plow? Now, remember, this is about 150, 160 AD. Jesus' resurrection is about 33 AD or so, right? So 130 years later, and this farmer says, see this plow? Jesus and his father made it for my great, 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 great grandfather. Isn't that interesting? The plow was still in use. But Justin Martyr said of Jesus, they pierced my hands and my feet, refer to the nails which he was fixed on his hands and his feet when he was crucified. And so Martyr talks about Jesus's death on the cross and his resurrection. So th this is really powerful, extra biblical material. We don't need it, but it is there because Jesus changed all history. He changed BC into AD. Nobody ever spoke like Jesus. Nobody ever lived like Jesus. Nobody ever did the miracles that Jesus did. Nobody ever loved like Jesus. Nobody ever died on the cross for our sins like Jesus. And no other religious leader had God raised from the dead on the third day. And Jesus, of course, is wonderful. And he had all the evidence and proof for his position. None of the others do. Now, if you look on this uh, uh, particular Facebook video, as well as when it gets on our YouTube channel, you'll see in the description there's a Patreon link. That Patreon, if you can go there and kick in a dollar or five bucks a month, that really, really helps me a lot and helps this ministry. If you can go there, we just started that up recently. If you can help, that would be great. The link on the Patreon is in the description on this video here on Facebook, as well as when it gets onto YouTube. Now, what's interesting is 
What's also interesting is the rabbinical literature talks about Jesus. So the rabbinical literature, including the Talmud, uh, and, and the other works of the Targums, the Midrash, all these works, Gemara of the, the Jewish people, just before Jesus was alive, during the time of Jesus, and just after the time of Jesus, they record this about Jesus. They said this, on the eve of Passover, they hung Jesus, or Yeshua, and a crier went out before him, Yeshua the Nazarene goes forth to be stoned because he practiced magic and deceived and led Israel astray. And they hung him on the eve of Passover. So notice this. It talks about Jesus being killed just when the New Testament said. Now this is a hostile source. Hostile legal sources are really powerful in a court of law. So this is a source. The Jewish people, the Jewish Jews who did not believe in Jesus, did not want this new religion to take off, and but yet they concede that Jesus was hung on Passover and executed. Another rabbi said this uh, in the Talmud. He says, and this is the Jerusalem Talmud, which is a smaller Talmud. There's a Babylonian Talmud, which is huge, and then there's a Jerusalem Talmud, which is smaller. The reason for that is because the, the greatest amount of sages and rabbis were outside of Jerusalem. They were mainly near Iraq and Baghdad area and around the Middle East, not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had a smaller percentage of rabbis. And so the Babylonian Talmud is much larger than the Jerusalem Talmud. Some of the material is, is the similar, but it is much, much larger. In the Jerusalem Talmud, it says this. Rabbi Abihu says, if a man says, I am God, he lies. If he says, I am the son of man, he shall rue it. If I go to heaven, he says he shall not perform it. So notice, they know the words that Jesus spoke and they're trying to teach against him because Jesus said this in John chapter three and John chapter eight. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> okay, that's what Jesus said. And of course the Jewish people that did not believe in Jesus. A lot of them did. Many became Christians. A lot of Pharisees became Christians. You can see that in Acts chapter 15. A lot of Sadducees. They were the folks that kind of had control of the temple. The Sadducees. A lot of them got saved. The temple priests. You can see that in Acts chapter 6 verse 7. And so Jesus' death and resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit had a major impact on the Jewish population. Many of them got saved. Now the Talmud is a collection of Jewish commentary, laws, and narratives. It's made up of the Mishnah and the Gemara and other works. It talks about um, uh, Jewish law and so forth. Now it says this also in the Babylonian Talmud. It says, it happened with Rabbi Ben Dama, whom a snake bit, that Jacob, a man of Kephar, Soma, came to heal him in the name of Yeshua Ben Pantera. But Rabbi Ishmael did not let him. He said, you are not permitted, Ben Dama. He answered, I will bring you proof that he may heal me. But he had no opportunity to bring proof because he died. Rabbi Ishmael said, happy are you, Ben Dama, for you have gone in peace and you've not broken down the fence of the sages, since everyone who breaks down the fence of the sages to him, punishment will ultimately come as in scripture, whoever breaks the fence, a serpent shall bite. That's amazing. So notice that particular passage in the Talmud talks about the disciples of Jesus healing people in the name of Jesus. But some of the rabbis who wanted to say Jewish Jews did not want that to happen. They thought that was wrong. When Rabbi Joshua ben Levi's grandson had an obstruction in his throat, a certain man came and whispered into his ear a spell. Notice he calls it a spell. It makes it sound negative. In the name of Jesus. And he began to breathe again. As a man was leaving, Rabbi Joshua asked him, what did you whisper in his ear? And he said, such and such spell. Rabbi Joshua said, it would have been better if my grandson died rather than recover by these means. And so you can see that there was healing that even the Jewish Jews mentioned in the Talmud done in Jesus name. Of course, they put a negative spin on it, but there's healing that even the Jewish Jews early on mention and record about Jesus and the disciples using his name to heal people. That's fascinating. That's powerful. Again, this is material outside the New Testament. So the rabbinic 
uh, sources tell us that Jesus was born under unusual circumstances, leading some rabbis to address him as Ben Pantera, because that's kind of an insult and is playing on the name of virgin. Because Jesus was virgin born, they pervert that word and make it a insult. Jesus, the rabbinical sources says, was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. Jesus was crucified on the eve of Passover. Jesus made himself alive by the name of God. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and God. Jesus would return again. Jesus claimed a kingdom. Jesus had disciples. Jesus performed miracles. Je people healed in Jesus' name. All that comes from rabbinical sources around the time of Jesus, hostile sources. So that's really, really interesting. So many scholars think that the virgin birth of Christ in the term Ben Pantera is alluded to because that is a play on the Greek word for virgin that's used in the Septuagint as well as in the Gospels. The Septuagint is the Old Testament that was translated in Greek hundreds of years before Jesus came. And it said in, in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 <coughs> that it's not just a young woman but a virgin. So we know that's the proper translation. So we see all this material from Tacitus. There's also some from Suetonius. Suetonius. It says this, he was banished from Rome. Uh, all the Jews who were continually making disturbances under the name of Crestos. So here's another source. And he was around 70 to 140 AD. Julius Africanus says, on the whole world there pressed the most fearful darkness and the rocks rent by an earthquake and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. Notice that, what was going on with the crucifixion. This darkness, Thales, in his third book of history, calls an eclipse of the sun. Phlegon records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at a full moon, was a full eclipse of the sun. So that, that's real interesting when it talks about that in relationship to Jesus' crucifixion at that time and the, the signs that occurred and the darkness that came and the earthquakes that came. So... Uh, Justin Martyr talks about Jesus being born a virgin, his death on the cross and his resurrection, the Messianic prophecies for proof. We see also Hegesippus. He was around 110 AD to 180. He says that there was a true witness to both Jews and Greeks that Jesus is the Christ. So that's what he said, that he was from the race of David, that he died under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and was raised from the dead. So that's what he said early on. Clement of Rome, around 98 AD or so, said the apostles received the gospel from us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sent forth from God. So when Christ is from God and the apostles are from Christ, therefore came the will of God in an appointed order, having therefore received a charge, being fully assured, notice this, fully assured of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what Clement said around 100 AD or so about Jesus. That's amazing. Just after 100 AD. Ignatius also just after 100 AD also talked about Jesus as a Christ, his death and resurrection. And so this is very, very interesting because the passage we talked at the start was Josephus and it talked about who Jesus was. And we can see from that passage different type of vocabulary that the Christians would not use. And the vocabulary and the style in much of it, even though some research recently has tried to dispute that, but the style and the writing within Josephus has a lot that's consistent with the rest of Josephus, but not with Christianity. So it's interesting how we see that. Now, Bar Serapian, around just after 70 AD or so, he said this about uh, Christ. He said, what advantage do the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged this wise man. So that's what's really interesting. So as we look at these passages in extra biblical literature, you see uh, Christ mentioned over and over again. Even though there was not that much material that's been saved from that time period, there's still significant amount, especially compared to the amount of material that we do have. The New Testament, though, we have page after page obviously revealing that Jesus is a Christ, died on the cross, and rose again. But when you examine any of this, if you put any of it on the table, you can't put God in the dock. Why? Because God alone furnishes the rational tools, these universal mutables, 
that were required to even bring forth an analysis on any subject, any historical truth or non-truth to discern whether it's true or not. You have to utilize these universal immutables, which only God, who has universal power and reach, can supply. Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Cross and Crown Channel is about presenting powerful proof for the Christian faith. If you want to support Mike as he makes videos and writes books, just go to Mike's Patreon page at patreon.com backslash mrob and kick in a buck or so. If you join us over there, that would be awesome. Supporting this work will help bring countless people to Christ. If you like this video, there's a donation button on our main YouTube page. Thanks for hanging out. Hey guys, you can really help us if you donate to our worldwide media outreach. Just go to our Patreon page at Mike Robinson Apologetics on Patreon or click the donate button on our main page on YouTube and give as the Lord leads. Thank you so much.